the last talk we're, we're going to talk about some of the future therapy, some of the thoughts that are coming out in melanoma, and hopefully the ability to understand that we have not just stopped and declared victory, you know, uh, in a jumpsuit on a carrier and then gone back, <laughs> but, but we're continuing to fight. <clears throat> just disclosures. Uh, but this is what happens uh, with, with patients and physicians. It's the big fat pink elephant in the room. What happens when this therapy that we're on, this roller coaster, stops and we don't know what's going on? And, and this person here is, could, clearly either be, could clearly either be the patient or the doctor not wanting to deal with that. But truly all physicians are trying to formulate a plan going forward, as are the scientists. So what's next, Bob? That's what the patients say to me. And sometimes I feel just like uh, my son here with the stethoscope. So we're just so early in our understanding of the pathways, how to combine these drugs, what the new targets are, that <clears throat> not only does this picture show a, a very infant physician beginning the trek, but also the look towards the future uh, Targeted therapy, we talked about NRAS and ERK and CMET, what's coming up, and we'll talk about that during this talk. And what else is going on in immunotherapy? <clears throat> Angiogenesis was brought up when we talked about uh, VEGF and Avastin. Where is that idea going through? And how do we target the microenvironment and how do we just target the tumor specifically? Dr. Carvajal. Uh, presented this idea of infusing into the artery where it goes uh, specifically into the, the tumor. But how can we preferentially target the tumor without having to be invasive? And then at the end, just to talk about brain metastases. <clears throat> uh, understanding tumor targets is important <coughs> based on where the melanoma begins, as you can tell. Uh, CKIT and NRAS grabbing a, a bigger share of the pie as a targeted agent and where to go forward. Clearly, as Dr. Kim had spoken, when we understood about BRAF and went forward, we were met with uh, some steps backward with the serafinib drug and ultimately moved forward with the vemurafenib. Where are we going with that? So <clears throat> we, we've seen this pathway, but just to point out that the ras raf mech pathway doesn't just end at mech, it ends with ERK and other places to target. So we are looking forward to that. Patients with NRAS mutations, which is denoted by the red line here, clearly have worse prognoses than patients who don't have that mutation or patients with BRAF mutation. And that's a significant uh, difference than other uh, patients with BRAF or wild type. So there are drugs, and uh, we've had uh, NRAS inhibitors in the clinic going forward, and it is an option. For those who don't have the BRAF mutation, hopefully when you see this talk or when you speak to your doctors, you ask, do I have the NRAS mutation or uh, for the uveal patients. Again, <clears throat> other targets. As you can see, uh, VEGFR, which is the Avastin target, which is the VEGF target. CMET, another mutation that is being targeted with multiple oral inhibitors, uh, <coughs> and ERK pathway inhibitors coming forward. But as we move from that into immunotherapy, we, were, we began by talking about the positive uh, outcomes with Uruvoy and ipilimumab, and <clears throat> the data with the PD-1 antibody, a drug that works similarly to uh, CTLA-4 inhibitors with possibly uh, less toxicity. What we didn't have before is what we've always been talking about. What is a prognostic marker? How do I know that I'm going to respond to this drug? You know you're going to respond to the Vemurafenib if you have the BRAF mutation. But clearly with immunotherapy, it's been a mixed bag. 
we haven't found those, those answers as hard as we've tried. But hopefully with PD-1, uh, we're looking at PD-L1 expression in the tumors and looking at whether that is associated with response. And this is from Brahmer et al. in the first uh, publication about PD-1 targeted therapy, where three out of four patients who had high staining had a partial response, but zero out of five of them who didn't have the staining. So all trials going forward are going to be looking at your tissue and looking to be able to take this data forward and have a, a predictive marker for response. Clearly, uh, if you can get that, we can have more of these, uh, this type of CT scan where you can see the tumor is uh, continuing to respond. Immune system surveillance is something that we are continuing to target and moving forward with. There, <clears throat> Dr. Hody spoke about the pitfalls of having an activated immune system all the time. If we didn't have CTLA-4 blockade, I would have psoriasis, you would have ulcerative colitis, we would all have some immune inflammation. But understanding that un allows us to understand how to target cells, and one of the major targets at this point are T regulatory cells. These are cells that don't work to target and eradicate tumor. They target to create tolerance of the tumor itself. So <clears throat> we're currently looking at a drug called ONTAC <clears throat> in melanoma, and this is a recombinant protein uh, that has a diphtheria toxin and targets CD25 T cells, those T regulatory cells, and causes them to go away. As you can see, <clears throat> the CD4 positive T reg, that can cause suppression on the effector cells, the cells that are clearly wanting to do the work. So if you can remove those cells in one way, you can have uh, a more vibrant immune response. So these CD4 positive CD25 <coughs> regulatory T cells have been found to suppress the activation of anti-tumor cells. So depletion of these has caused uh, rejection of melanoma in mice, and currently we're looking at those in a clinical trial. Early studies presented have shown some response and continued benefit. <clears throat> in addition, Immune regulation doesn't just exist with the T cells. Uh, there are immunosuppressive cytokines uh, and metabolic inhibitors that are found in the tumor stroma. And those, we don't have a clear understanding why they exist. Is it because the tumor has come in, the immune system has ramped up, and then the body is increasing these metabolites to suppress the immune system, and one of those is IDO, indolamine deaminase. <clears throat> in other tumors, we found that increased staining for this in human tumors is associated with decreased survival, and you can see ovarian melanoma, colon, and pancreatic. So we have this idea that it uh, modulates tumor growth. So inhibition of this can inhibit tumor growth and enhance tumor-specific killing through multiple approaches. And <clears throat> we've initially seen it that it can synergize with chemotherapy and other cytokines. So since this acts in an immune-dependent uh, immune manner, can we target this for chemotherapy? <coughs> So we, we, since we know that this activity can diminish efficacy of uh, anti-tumor response uh, and it can enhance T, cell, T regulatory formation uh, and prevent T helper or those, those T cells that eradicate tumor, it, is, it makes sense that if some way we could bomb those things or get them out or erase them, uh, we, we can get a more robust immune response. Uh, we've looked, interestingly, at this in relation to ipilimumab, and uh, a group of investigators, the, the investigators presented 
a trial where we looked at patients who had uh, biopsies done right before they began ipilimumab and right after their second dose of ipilimumab. When we looked to see if there was anything in the tumor stroma, anything in the blood that could help us understand what is uh, going on, we did come up, although these are very small subsets and these are very pre preliminary data, you can see the last line, IDO expression at baseline was associated with a higher rate of clinical activity. This data is not great data to hang your hat on and say that it's, it's now written in stone, but it is a beginning. And clearly, the reason I bring this up is not just because it's a, a way to uh, peak interest in this type of therapy, because we, there are trials that are coming out with endolamine deaminase inhibitors and ipilimumab, uh, but it is an, a beginning of understanding how to pick out those people sitting in this room who may do better with a specific immunotherapy approach or not. It's also an idea to begin our discussions about why we need biopsies for clinical trials. I know the investigators sitting here with me will tell you that it's a long and difficult discussion to bring in a, a patient who's now looking for therapy and discuss doing another biopsy while we already have a diagnosis. But please understand that these are the ways that we find out what these predictive and prognostic markers are. And clearly there is a, a trial on, on coming based on the fact that IDO inhibitors can relieve immune suppression at the tumor site and are a novel anti-cancer strategy, combinatorials with this and uh, uh, immunotherapy are ongoing. <clears throat> Moving forward, I did tell you that I would talk about it a different way to target the tumor and try to spare normal cells. And the idea of an antibody drug conjugate does this. We all know antibodies. Antibodies are <clears throat> what our body makes to target something that's foreign. Uh, this is how we get rid of bacteria or infection. Uh, but scientists have been able to link a cytotoxic agent, a chemotherapeutic, a payload. So this is somewhat like a Trojan horse that targets primarily tumors based on a specific expression profile. If this tumor is different from other normal cells in that it wears a red shirt, this antibody targets the red shirt tumors, just to make it basic. <clears throat> and this is the concept. As you can see, that beautiful uh, antibody will target a specific uh, target on the melanoma cells. In this case, it's endothelin B receptor, which is overexpressed in melanoma. It carries with it those uh, fluorescent yellow toxins, which is a chemotherapeutic. And once it attaches to that cell, it gets internalized. And you can see that here. And once it gets internalized, the chemotherapy gets released, and hopefully it will lead to aggressive uh, tumor eradication um, and cell death. So that's another way to move forward with therapy. Uh, VEGF, which was talked about before when we talked about Avastin and Sunitinib, <clears throat> is vascular endothelial growth factor. It is increased in tumors because what it does is basically recruits uh, vascular uh, arteries and vessels to come in and feed the tumor for growth. High VEGF levels in tumors have been associated with poorer prognosis, and VEGF levels are associated, uh, increase in them levels are associated with when a normal nebus changes into a malignant phenotype and an invasive melanoma. Clearly, as you can see here, uh, associated with worse outcomes. So the line F is the survival curve for patients with a higher level of VEGF expression. 
we know that it affect high levels of VEGF can affect response to even immunotherapy, uh, like high dose interleukin two. So clearly, the the movement forward in this aspect is finding those novel VEGF inhibitors that can do that. XL one eighty four is a <clears throat> a drug that targets MET, as you can remember, we talked about that at the beginning of this talk, and also VEGF. Uh, these both are key mm -hmm. mediators of angiogenesis, which is vessel proliferation, and <clears throat> upregulation of MET and VEGF lead to more invasive phenotypes. This is a study that was presented in 2010 <coughs> that took all comers, but when it looked at the patients with melanoma, showed significant uh, responses, uh, <clears throat> even in ocular melanoma. And uh, this is one of those drugs where uh, the physicians in this room are clearly feel can have a benefit, not just in cutaneous uh, melanoma, but mucosal and ocular melanomas, clearly based on this idea of targeting VEGF. Uh, this is just a representative photo of uh, a patient on and then scans at week 12. You can see on the top, a lung lesion that shrank, on the bottom, liver lesions that shrank, and the pet activity <coughs> went away. Clearly correlative to the data that Dr. Hody showed with, uh, with his, uh, Avastin and ipilimumab. So uh, the understanding of how we can target this pathway is important. This was a drug that showed a high disease control rate at 12 weeks. It was very tolerable and uh, had uh, targeted MET and VEGF. Now, this is not a new idea, and I don't want to come back to uh, randomized trials that were negative, but Dr. Kim showed the serafinib trial. This is a trial that Dr. Kim published at the beginning of this year uh, in JCO, which looked at carbotaxol with or without Avastin. <clears throat> in all comers, there was no clear benefit in survival. So this was deemed a negative study. But when you tease out a subgroup, there's something interesting comes forward that needs to be reviewed and looked at with a uh, magnifying glass and, and looked at better. Those patients who received, <coughs> who received therapy uh, with the, the drug may have uh, done better. Again, excitinib, and I'll go over this really shortly, is another drug. And you can see, as we've all learned today, how to read waterfall plots, that this drug itself the same type of targeting the pathway did well. Uh, again, the, va the vascular lattice that supports tumors and brings nutrition is only part of what's around in the matrix. And <clears throat> clearly, we're now not just targeting the immune system, not just targeting the vascular system, uh, but looking at uh, the stroma the inf infrastructure around tumors, and endosalin is expressed in the stromal compartment of all tumors. And this is an antibody that targets there. Uh, many of you who've been in the clinic have heard about it. Uh, uh, and it's supposed to disrupt that area and uh, have an effect on the tumor cells inhibiting key pathways of growth, in addition, uh, preventing key interactions within the stroma of tumor cells, leading to tumor disruption and death. And this is another drug that's out there in the phase one arena, looking at what the toxicities are, what, we've, what we're seeing, and where it's going forward. <clears throat> so I'm going to stop right there and say to you that it is a beginning. Clearly, the data to, to present is not as awe-inspiring as what we have seen from our previous speakers. But if you had heard the discussions about 
ipilimumab or vemurafenib at the initial uh, portions, you would have heard some of the same things, that we're clearly trying to understand who the patients are that benefit by finding what it is about their tumor, their tumor environment, their immune system, and their makeup that will allow us to say that everybody may have a small response rate, but this subgroup may have a higher response rate. So I want to end by just talking about brain metastases. It's the big elephant in the room uh, where a majority of patients will ultimately deal with this. Clearly, up until now, we haven't had good therapies, but to bring it together, the BRAF inhibitors have been looked at in patients with brain metastases and presented, and clearly by some mechanisms, this can get into the central nervous system. This is a MRI where you're looking at a uh, frontal cut of somebody and the brain, and, the, and those brain meds which were there and life-threatening have begun to respond clearly to just BRAF inhibition. And it's a stepping stone to find better therapies. Uh, this uh, trial is, will be um, presented and published in Lancet in next week. And it was a look at ipilimumab in patients with brain metastases that haven't been treated with surgery or radiation. And I think this is your patient, Dr. Hody. And clearly, you cannot argue with what you're seeing on this, where the ipilimumab had the ability to stimulate the immune system and cause a response and a clear duration of response that has led to survival benefit for patients. So we have more tools in the toolbox. Survival curves, uh, like you've never seen before, one-year survivals of 30 percent, uh, where the numbers are, you know, 10 percent normally. <clears throat> so what we're getting at is that we're understanding more prognostic factors for stage four metastatic disease, uh, trying to increase opportunities to expand prognostic variables uh, to include lab tests, evaluation of the immune system, um, and evaluation of tissues, with the goal of having more personalized treatment selection, better prognostic assessment that can help us understand whether we need to be more aggressive to begin with or not. I was going to say this the last, for a long time I've been giving a talk and talking about the elephant in the room. And I went to a foundation meeting where a, another doctor from Memorial Sloan, where Dr. Carvajal has come from, ended with saying that we should just change our paradigm and think about the stallion in the room, learn to harness it to the benefit of our patients. So of course I went back to my room and Googled stallion in the room, and I came up with this. <laughs> and it is truly a paradigm shift. These drugs have allowed us to think more positively. Uh, these trials are allowing us to continue to have the positive hope of finding combination therapies and finding prognostic markers. Um, and never is that more beneficial than now. And I want to end by just showing a picture of my stallion. This is a patient of ours who just ran the LA Marathon. 